All right, so welcome, welcome back for part two of week two of cover to cover. Now we're going to look at numbers in Deuteronomy. This will be a lot shorter. Um, Leviticus was long, but again, it's like so hard. These first books, we really, I, I want to make sure I cover high level, but still like all the things that you need to know to help you understand and have context for the rest of the story of scripture. So now we're looking at numbers in the Hebrew. It, it, its name would be in the desert of or in the wilderness and then that's very appropriate once we get into the story and in the Greek version it, it means literally numbers as we have it so numbers is centered around three main geographical locations so here we're going to still be at Sinai in the beginning um, as they make their final preparations to then set off for the promised land which is what, what God intends for them but we're going to see some delays. So the next main location we encounter is Kadesh. Here they're in the wilderness and this becomes a time of wandering and we'll talk about that. And then finally we end numbers in Moab um, as they're preparing to make that cross into the promised land and some significant things happen in that location. So Numbers has a couple of different layers of interpretation and significance for the Israelite people. Um, it tells this, their past history. So they would refer to this story when they talked about Moses and Aaron and that whole generation that didn't get to enter the promised land. You can imagine that as they're telling their children and passing down the stories of Israel, um, everyone, Moses is so highly regarded. He, he always is the pinnacle figure for for Israel and everyone's measured against Moses and so how is it that Moses doesn't get to go into the promised land that's a question that needs to be answered and so numbers tells us that story it also is important for the Jews um, as it's being written it was probably finalized sometime during or just after the exodus exile when Exodus is going to become their story again, we're going to see post-exile that they're going to make a return to Jerusalem. And some of what happens here in Exodus and Numbers and even Leviticus is going to be reconstituted at that time. So we'll talk about that more when we get to those books. And then it speaks to the future. All implicit in all of these laws and regulations and stories is both warning and promise for the future. Don't disobey and the promised land is going to be yours to enjoy as a people, as a nation. This isn't individual, this is nationwide. Um, disobey and it's going to get taken from you. And that's what's going to happen because as a people, they're going to disobey. So the numbers of numbers, um, all numbers in the Old Testament are difficult to interpret because they aren't quite functioning like modern day numbers in a lot of instances. I mean, where there's small numbers, you know, one or two or counting off, you know, seven people in a family. Okay, maybe. But when it gets to like the higher numbers, a lot of times we struggle with what are they really saying? Is this a literal interpretation or is there some kind of stylization or some symbolism going on. So if we literally interpreted the numbers of numbers, then the amount of people would be too large for what the land could support at the time. Remember I talked about this last week. Archaeological evidence does not support this idea of like two million people coming out of Egypt and then entering the promised land all at once. It just, the land itself doesn't support that. And there's no archaeological evidence that's out, that that's what happened. So then we say, okay, well, what might these numbers symbolize? <clears throat> so some people say, well, maybe thousands means tribes or just the chieftain. And then you might ask, you know, playing devil's advocate, well, okay, but then why wouldn't they just say that? Who knows, right? Again, we don't, all communication is underdetermined. We don't have access to the people that are recording these numbers to go, well, what do you really mean? How are we supposed to take it? Literal or some kind of some symbolism here? Um, some Another scholar says the census list represents an ancient tradition of tribal quotas of people available, of men available for war. So it's, the numbers really signify like military units. 
again, why not just say this? Maybe this was implied or understood by the people that were writing. Perhaps some kind of numerology is involved. Numerology was highly used in these times. We'll see numerology come into play when we look at Revelation. Whatever the case, it appears to us that these numbers are stylized. They're symbolic. Again, because it just doesn't make sense that like 2 million people are entering the promised land all at once. So just kind of hold that in your head. We'll encounter numbers again and always be wrestling with this issue. So theology of numbers. Well, we're going to see the continued presence of God amidst God's people. That has been something we've been seeing from the beginning of the patriarchal time. Uh, we'll see God's providence in providing for the people's needs, especially once they're in the wilderness and things, you know, provisions are harder to come by there. We will see God's patience. It's very much tested. And so we'll learn something about God in that respect. And then we'll see the importance of intercession. The whole nation of Israel was meant to be intercessors. And then remember, we learned in Leviticus, we've got this priesthood, which becomes the intercessors for Israel. And then in, amongst the priests, the high priest becomes the intercessor, the, the highest intercessor possible. Um, the idea, how can a sinful people have fellowship with a holy God? Well, it's through the sacrificial, sacrificial system and also this idea of intercession. And that's going to link to prayer as well. And then we're going to see God represented as the God of all the nations. Remember, I said this in just this last Leviticus lecture. God does not just care about the Israelites. God cares about the entire world. God cares about all people. The Israelites are no better or worse than any other people in God's eyes. God loves us in modern day times, in past times. God loves us. God loves you and me just as we are. We cannot earn that love. We cannot lose God's love. God loves you, period. End of story. From the day you're born until forever, God loves you. God loves all people. And so, yes, this is the story of Israel. We're going to look at the world through their perspective, and it's their story of how they both live up to and fail to live up to the call that God has placed on their lives. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't love the people living in the promised land that have never heard of him. And so we see this embodied here in Numbers through the talking donkey narrative, which is one of my favorites. It's so crazy. We're going to see legal provisions continue. So that was basically what Leviticus was. Um, but here in Numbers, we're going to see it worked out. So uh, how does Israel worship? How does God judge their disobedience when they don't do what they're supposed to do? And sort of final preparations again to take possession of the promised land. And then we're going to see God use the people of instruments of, uh, or use the law as a means of grace. I talked about that with Leviticus that enables the people to live in God's community and enables God to live amongst the people. So some difficult things to read in Numbers. <clears throat> we have these um, three men and their families that are swallowed up after they rebel against God and Moses. And while we might be able to say, all right, we get that the three men um, were engaged in egregious sin. It was intentional sin. It wasn't an accident. Um, they did wrong and they didn't repent for it. And so, yes, they, you know, the punishment for sin is death. And if you don't repent and then offer a sacrifice as a substitution, the punishment is going to fall on you. But what's hard to read about is that all of their families die with them, you know, their wives, their children. And that's tough to read. It should be tough to read. If we were to read that and be like, oh, good, <laughs> that's not, that's a soul check for us. Um, but here's the harsh, difficult truth about sin. It affects not just the sinner. And sometimes it affects innocent people in far worse ways than even the sinner, him or herself. Sin has this radius of suffering that seems to affect people in close proximity as well. And there's some ownership too for the families. You know, they could have run away. Moses warned them, get away. This is what's going to happen if you don't. And they stood their ground. Um, and there's a lot to unpack there. Women did not have 
agency like we do now. Um, of course, children really don't have agency, that they, they probably didn't have much of a choice. So it, it's difficult to read through, but it's also, again, this idea of sin. And also, the three men could have said, no, spare my family. Family, go away right now. Children, run away. Like, this is me. It's not on you. This is my sin. But they didn't. And so the consequences were great. And that's true in our time as well. Horrible things happen to innocent people sometimes because of the terrible decisions of other people. Unfortunately, horribly, terribly, it is the way this broken world works. But God is at work to make that right, to fix it, to redeem it, and to restore it. And so we're going to see that story unfold. And then we have the account in Numbers 20, which is the explanation for how it comes to be that Moses and Aaron don't get to enter the promised land. So uh, bless Moses. I mean, he interceded for these people. He said to God, don't destroy these people. And yet he gets tired. And what I, I'm reading into it, but I think I'm safe to read into it. And you can decide what you think. I think Moses and Aaron are burned out. They have been doing a lot. Uh, remember way back to the beginning of Moses' leadership, got, you know, through his father-in-law and other things. It was like, you can't do it all yourself. You've got to have other people to help you, Moses. And here in Numbers 20, it just gets the better of him. And Moses does not follow God's instructions. He lectures the people. He attributes the water to himself, which, oh, Moses, why? Why? You know better. And he himself strikes the rock, the rock with the rod, not once but twice, when God tells him not to. Moses is great. He's wonderful. He matures so much over the course of the Pentateuch, but he's still a man. He's not perfect. Like all of us, he's prone to stress, tiredness, burnout, the very best leader also can succumb to these things. It happens more often than not in ministry that pastors and ministry leaders get burned out. Um, I think it's some of the nature of being in ministry is that you dedicate yourself and you want to do all these things and you want to give yourself to all these people. But if you don't have proper boundaries, that can end up being a negative thing. And so for whatever happens to Moses, he doesn't obey God and he attributes God's grace and mercy and provision to himself, which is always, always bad. And at this point, they know better. As you progress in leadership and in maturity, as we progress in our own personal journey of faith, we are going to be held to a higher standard. The more we know, <laughs> the more we're responsible for. And that's not to scare us because that's what we should be wanting. It's, it's to always remind us that it's not a, in the end just about knowledge, but it's about a relationship with God. If we learn all there is to learn, but don't have a relationship with God, we're still going to end up in a bad place. We need that relationship with God. If we have a relationship with God, but refuse to learn and grow and mature and do hard, scary things and be courageous, we're going to be stunted in our relationship with God and we're not going to experience all the blessings that God has for us. So with leadership comes great responsibility. I think that's a quote from Spider-Man. My son would be so proud. Um, great responsibility, great reward, but also some difficult things as well. And so that is why Moses and Aaron are punished and not allowed to enter into the promised land. And here's a map that just shows their wanderings. So their journey from Sinai to actually entering the promised land should have taken like a few months. And instead it takes 40 years because of their sinfulness and disobedience to God. And here's another um, map that you can look at later that kind of shows where they are when things are happening. Um, here's a picture of the Israelite encamp encampment. So we've looked at the tabernacle in our Leviticus lecture, but here's what it looks like all around them. Um, and you can see there were arrangement. There are places for each tribe, again, dependent on their roles. So Moses and Aaron and the priests and these other three tribes are closest to the tabernacle because they all have parts to play in either maintaining the tabernacle 
or transporting it. So that's the amazing thing when we read this story is that this isn't a permanent structure. So every time, remember, if the cloud lifts or the fire lifts and God indicates that it's time to move on, they are packing up all of this and carrying it through the wilderness to the next place that they encamp. And sometimes they encamp for what I imagine is weeks or even months. And sometimes it's a matter of days before they are called to set out on the journey again. So just picture this, picture living in that time, trying to do life, trying to maintain you know, purity and cleanliness and holiness being parents and having young toddlers running around that get into all kinds of trouble because kids are kids, um, being a woman that is pregnant and giving birth in the midst of this, being a priest that's responsible for being an intercessor for the people and also worrying about, okay, how are we physically going to make it to the next point in our journey? It is, it's a lot. It's a lot. And so, yes, the people are willfully disobedient to God, but at the same time, we see God's grace and providing for them. They are never without food and sustenance. They are never without God's presence is always with them during this journey. And so even though they confront hardship, because that is the way of the world, they should have still remained faithful to God. All right, so next we're going to look at Deuteronomy. I know that was fast and furious through numbers. You might have more detailed questions. So again, bring those to Zoom and we will talk about them or send me an email. All right, so let's quickly look at Deuteronomy. Um, this is in Hebrew. It's called, This book is called The Words and ours is Deuteronomy. So this, like I said, is kind of a recap, the greatest of Moses' sermons, a compilation, greatest hits album. And it's a look ahead to remind people of what God requires. Um, this is a very significant book in the Old Testament. It's one of the most quoted books in the New Testament. There are sections and quotations from every chapter that were found in the caves at Qumran. Um, just briefly, that's where um, in like the 1950s, 40s, somewhere in there, I'll have to look at the exact date, they discover all these um, parchments, papyrus, papyri, that end up being uh transcripts of the Bible. So, and a lot of them are old and dated to certain dates. We'll talk more about them as we go. I don't want to spend too much time because I know this has been long already. Um, okay. And so Jesus quotes Deuteronomy often. So um, there's the instance where he is resisting temptation by Satan and Satan misquotes Deuteronomy and uh, Jesus corrects Miss Satan's misspoken words about um God. And then the Shema we find in Deuteronomy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. Um, this is a significant saying for Israelites and for Jewish people today. Um, this is something that you'll see like they will have, um, I can't remember what the name of it is, but the thing that they have outside their door that has the Shema on it, they would wear it in necklaces around their neck. Um, they would bind it. You know, sometimes you see like very Orthodox Jewish people with mm -hmm. the phylacteries on their heads and their arms. The Shema is included within that. So um, an important saying for them. So we did not do a lot of reading in Deuteronomy because Deuteronomy really is a recap of everything that we've read in the, in the, you know, Exodus, uh, Leviticus and Numbers. But in the future, should you not want to read through Leviticus again, and trust me, I understand, um, you could read Deuteronomy and get really the theological weight that you're supposed to get from the books of the Pentateuch. So Deuteronomy is really a theological recap, and so that's why it's so often quoted. For us, Leviticus is interesting and helps you know set a foundation for us, but the theology is where it's always at. So in the future, if you want to recap, just look at Deuteronomy. So again, like Numbers, the people of Israel would have interpreted this in several ways. It, you know, is the final cross, the final words of Moses before he dies and the people go into the promised land. It features covenant renewal. You'll see covenant renewal a lot. The people mess up and they renew their covenant and it kind of cleanses the palate and puts them in a right relationship with God again. 
It also was significant in the period in which it was written in the late monarchy. Um, and we're going to find it pop up in the book of Kings when Josiah, one of the good kings of Judah, engages in some reform in 621 BC. He actually uncovers the book of Deuteronomy and realizes that they haven't been following the law because at that point they were so bad and corrupted and sinful that they had lost the books of the law and they had forgotten what they were supposed to do as God's people. And then um, it's significant again, and we'll talk about this when the people are in exile, but it's going to become like a handbook to remind them of who they are, to help them on their journey out of exile and back into the heart of God and to help them form themselves once again as God's people. So again, that Shema is, in, is important. It is instructions. It sounds so similar to what we're going to see Jesus say in the New Testament, which is, you know, Jesus' question, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, love God and love your neighbor. Well, here it's kind of that in Old Testament form. It doesn't talk about neighbor, but how do you love God with all your soul and all, all your might? You do what God has asked you to do. You live out your calling, which is to be in community with, in relationship with other human beings and to be, go back to that Azer concept, which Adam and Eve were first created to be, which is helpers. So we love each other. And by loving each other, that's how we show our love for God. And the Shema also signifies the uniqueness of God and his relationship with Israel. Remember, we talked about this in the Genesis lecture, how different this faith is from all the other religious ideas happening in the ancient Near East. Everybody else is multi worshiping multiple gods. Their gods and goddesses are capricious. They can't be relied on for anything. They don't really love people. They're just using human beings for their own purposes. And here it's a, a relationship built first and foremost on love. God's love for us and our love for God in return. And the rest of it is the way in which to live out that relationship. Um, we recap in Deuteronomy that God is a God who acts. God is not up in heaven or wherever heaven is in some other plane, just kind of passively, passively watching what's happening to humanity. God is deeply invested and involved in what is going on. Um, God wants to reside amongst God's people. God provides for the people often in miraculous ways that show his love and provision for God's people. And God also acts through other human beings who answer God's call to be the hands and feet and voices of God amidst the rest of the ancient Near East. And so Deuteronomy recaps this concept of the nation of Israel, that God uh, created this nation out of the least and the last of society. The, the slaves of Egypt become God's chosen people, not because they are any better than the rest of the people that were living at the time, not because God loves them more than he loves anybody else, but because of God's grace and goodness. And God wants to show the world that God will use the least and last and lost if you will be obedient and have faith. God will use you. It's not about what you do. It's not about where you're born. It's not about what you look like. It's about relationship. If you love God, then God is going to bless that by using you as God's intercessor for others. And that's true in the Old Testament and it's true in the New Testament as well. So we're reminded in Deuteronomy of this concept of covenant relationship. This is key. This is going to become the basis for what the prophets are going to have to say um, in regards to what happens during the time of the kings. Um, but the covenant relationship is how they are formed as a people. It's also their inheritance. They're going to get blessings or curses depending on if they hold to this covenant relationship. And it also details the establishment of God's throne. Um, to sin is to rebel against this covenantal claim and to invite God's judgment and wrath upon yourself. Because remember, if you sin, if it's intentional, you must confess and repent and then offer your sin offering as payment for the punishment that should be yours. And if you don't do that, then the judgment is going to fall where it right where it originally belongs, which is on to you. 
Um, and that judgment is going to be pertain not just to Israel, but to the other nations as well. We're going to, to kind of explore that. Deuteronomy speaks to it, but we're going to see how that plays out, especially when we look at the book of the prophets. Because the prophets are going to have a lot to say as God's mouthpieces. Deuteronomy recaps as well God acting in history. Again, God is active. God is not separate from humankind and from creation. God works in and through history and in and through this people called Israel. So doctrine and theology is unique, continually speaking to God's sovereignty, to God's consistency. God is who God is. That's what the name Adonai or Yahweh means. I am who I am. And as human beings, it's our responsibility to understand what that means as best as we can. Also to realize that God is holy and other. God is not a person. We want to give him human attributes because that's the language we have. That's how we make sense of things. We cannot conceive of God in God's true form because we've never experienced something like that. We get tastes of it here on earth, but we're going to experience it fully you know, once we get into eternity, but we're always to remember that God is sovereign and in God's sovereignty, God has allowed human beings and creation itself to recreate, to have, you know, a little bit of, of creative capabilities themselves. Um, again, God didn't create a closed world. God created an open world that has evolved over time. And so we remember that it's in God's sovereignty that God has allowed that. But God remains consistent. Human beings don't. God does. And so when we have tension where it seems like God is acting differently than we understand him, that is because of our our human inability to fully grasp God. And so we got to lean into those what seem like discrepancies or things that don't work together. We got to lean into that and kind of puzzle through it and try to, to help us, ourselves understand it better. So the entire book recite, recites what God has done on behalf of this nation, Israel. Um, again, people have free will. God is angered and frustrated by the choices that God's people make, but God's purpose also always prevails. So there seems to be tension there, but it's not if you understand that in God's sovereignty, God's allowing people to make choices. And then God comes along behind those choices. And as we learned in Genesis with the story of Joseph, God will bring good out of what was intended for evil because God is always kind of knitting things together. Um, I've heard it described as like a cruise ship. If we imagine a cruise ship leaving from Miami headed to the Bahamas, it's going to the Bahamas and that cruise ship is going to get there. But on the cruise ship, people can choose. I Some people might go to the pool. Some people might go see a live show. Some people might go to the movies. They have movie theaters on cruises. Some people might choose to spend the whole time at the buffet. Other people might choose to be sleeping in their cabin. On the cruise ship, people have choices to make. It's choices within boundaries. There's not exponential choices of what they can do, but they have choice. And yet that cruise ship is going to head for the Bahamas. Something similar when we think about the relationship between God's sovereignty and the free will that God gives to man, humankind. And we also learn, very important thing, nothing is impossible for God. God is not bound by our laws. Um, God is not bound by time. God is not bound by physical nature or science or anything else. God can do anything. And so God often does the impossible. And we see that continue as we work our way through the Old Testament. Uh, remember that idea of progressive revelation. I talked about this in our very first Zoom class. The idea that um, we're on this journey with Israel. And so their understanding of God is always going to be incomplete in the Old Testament because we needed Jesus Christ to reveal God fully and completely to us. And so we're on this journey of understanding God right along with them. And so for us, we then take what we know about Jesus and the things that we learn in the Gospels and in the letters of the early church, and we use those as a lens with which to look back at the Old Testament 
and say, okay, well, they were misunderstanding this about God. It, Jesus, because of Jesus, we know that this is what God is really meaning. So, um, idolatry at this point, worshiping other gods, would have just completely destroyed this nation of, of Israel. It, God's plan of redemption is to work first through this nation of Israel. And so God is going to be very vigilant about idolatry and he's going to wipe it out where he sees it. And so we are going to see punishment occur, especially when it comes to idolatry. There's a theology that emerges out of these early books, and we'll see it as well in the books of the kings, that oh, if you're obedient, you're going to be blessed. And if you're disobedient, God's blessing is going to be removed. And that is true, but not true in the way that they're going to understand it. It's true, first of all, as a, on a nation level. If Israel as a nation is obedient, they're going to have the promised land. If they are disobedient, that land is going to be removed from them. If they're obedient as a nation, they're going to be fruitful and multiply both land and as a people. If they're disobedient, the land's going to dry up. Their wombs are going to close. They're not going to enjoy fruitfulness. Those are the terms of the covenant. But as individuals and even nationwide, bad things also happen. People make terrible choices. You can be affected by someone else's sin. You can be affected by evil. And so when we get to the wisdom literature, this is going to become a way to nuance this idea of obedience equals blessing, disobedience equals removal of blessing. And the New Testament's either going, even going to further nuance it. And it's going to be that it's not about physical blessings. It's not about material blessings in this world. It's about the presence of God. It's about the blessing of being used by God, of getting to intercede for someone on their behalf to God. Those are blessings. And then, of course, with Jesus Christ, it's the blessing of the afterlife, of eternity, of getting to be with God for eternity. And disobedience then becomes the removal of those spiritual blessings. So this is going to get nuanced as we go. Um, so hold that thought in your head and really, we'll really get into it when we look at the wisdom literature. So um, a question I got from last week, why does God say, and we see this in Exodus, that he's going to keep mercy for thousands and yet visit the iniquity of the fathers to the third and fourth generations. We see this phrase throughout the Old Testament, but I think it first comes up in Exodus when uh, Moses is hidden in the cleft of the rock and God God passes by, if you will, and, and Moses sees like the tail end of God's glory and God kind of pronounces, you know, I, sh I will show mercy to thousands of generations and visit the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generations. This is where language becomes important. This is an idiom or a saying in Hebrew meant to express continuance. So the idea is that mercy God will show to thousands. It's it's really, really that concept is kind of unending continuance of God's mercy. Whereas sin has ramifications, but it's held in check. It's not forever. It's not to thousands. You know, it's just a few generations. God is, I wrote it here, merciful to the thousandth degree. Sin has ramifications that extend to the generations that come after us but it also has an ending point. Um, so hopefully that helps make sense of that. And so finally, just the applications that we always want to think through as we close out each week's reading. And of course, in the newsletter, I will include more than these questions, but two big ones. What did I learn about God from these books? What did I learn about the mission of God? And what do I learn about how I, living in 2022, can participate in that mission? So I hope you enjoyed these lectures. Um, next week we move into the historical books, which some of you will find really enjoyable because we'll be moving forward at a little more rapid pace and um, sort of le leaving the world of the law behind. But it's so important to have this foundation because it's going to help us understand what happens in the story of Israel as we move forward. So let me close, if I can, for by praying for all of you. And I look forward to seeing you in Zoom this week. If you can't make it to Zoom, of course, I'll have a recording of the Tuesday class for you to watch. And if you have a question, please, please send me an email. All right, let me pray. 
Gracious God, thank you so much for your revelation and the gift of your word and that we can study the Bible and learn so much about you and about our relationship with you and what we're called to do as human beings. So God, I hope that as we continue the study of the Bible, that you would open our hearts and minds to receive the insight that you would have us glean. God, um, show us new things, answer our questions, address our fears, Lord, and help us in community to work through these things together to bring understanding to one another, to receive each other with grace and mercy in our discussion time. And Lord, help us to learn how to go forth and be a priesthood for you, how to make your glory known, to bring compassion and mercy and hope and goodness and light and love to a world that desperately needs it. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen, and I will see you guys um, in Zoom. Thank you.